I don't know how many times a week he came to Babylon, but every time we were there on a Wednesday, he was there too. As far as I could tell, he was a creature of habit, always sitting at the bar on the far inner edge, browsing, hiding, and enjoying the fine cognac. He tried not to stand out, but it was hard not to notice a man in his forties in a hipster bar. He was tall, fit, carefully dressed, wore a Rolex watch, and sported a large gold ring that looked like a mob boss's ring on his wedding finger. There were times when I noticed him approach a pretty girl sitting alone at the bar and order her a drink. After some time, they went outside together. One day, I even saw him approach a young couple's table and, after a short conversation, walk off with the woman, leaving the confused guy behind. It seemed very strange to me at the time, but I didn't think it was any of my business. Babylon was our regular meeting place. By our, I mean myself, my wife Beth, and our close friends Dean and Donna, whom I nicknamed the Ding Dongs. We all worked for the same company and lived on the same street downtown, a few blocks away from each other. Dean and Donna started dating before I joined the company. When I became Dean's friend, Donna matched me with her old friend Beth, and we all became an inseparable foursome. Babylon was located smack in the middle of the road between our apartment building and the Ding Dong's house, so it was a natural choice for a hangout. Ben, the owner of the establishment for the past 16 years, has always made sure to keep the establishment in excellent condition with excellent service. I'm Jack, 28-year-old programmer. The company we all work for was formed four years ago. I worked there for three years. She has raised over $200 million in venture capital. Our product was at an advanced stage of development, and I heard that behind the scenes, major shareholders had already received offers for an impressive amount of exit. However, as far as I knew at the time, no one had made any deals yet. My wife was our general director's secretary for a year and a half. Dean was the programmer on my team, and Donna was the accountant. Every Wednesday night, we sat at our usual table, which Ben usually saved for us. We arrived around nine and stayed until closing at midnight. Usually after the third draft beer, when we were really tipsy, we would start playing a stupid game called How Much, or simply the Game of Babylon. I have no idea who started it or when it became a tradition, but the environment without the Babylon game just wasn't the same. That environment was no different. 50,000, Dean replied to my last offer. What? You just offered me 5,000 for the same thing. I pretended to be offended. Relax, dude. It's just business. We're negotiating here. No need to get emotional. Okay, no deals. Let's move on to the next question. How much does a night with a dwarf woman cost? Are you kidding me? This is my old fantasy. I'm ready to pay for it. What about the dwarf man? Uh, I don't know, I said, trying to suppress a laugh. It depends on who's pitching and who's catching. What do you mean? It's for the whole night. You'll take turns on duty. I pay a lot of money here. Then no deal. Even for billions. Fuck off. How long would it take you to do this? I asked, trying to change the subject. Fifty thousand. Can you really do it? Certainly. If it's due to a confidentiality agreement, then it's not a problem. No one will ever know, and I get a six-month salary. But you will know. I will survive. I'll give you 50,000, Beth said. That's 50,000 more than what you guys expect us to do for free. No, one million, Dean answered bravely. You just asked for a quarter of a million. Yes, but it was under different conditions. I'll give you 100,000, Beth countered. It's a deal, Dean declared triumphantly with a Cheshire grin on his face as he extended his hand towards my wife to seal the deal. You really are a little bitch, aren't you? I teased. It's just 20 minutes of trouble and I get a year's salary for it. I might have to pay back some of the money for psychological therapy, but only a crazy person wouldn't agree to that dream deal. Or someone with self-esteem and a minimum set of principles, I said with reproach in my voice. What about you, Jack? How much will you ask for? Asked Donna. There is no amount that would make me agree to do this. It's a matter of principle. Simple and easy. Bullshit! An unfamiliar voice rang out from our right side. Everything has its price. 
We turned to look in the direction of the explosion and saw a tall, tanned, well-dressed stranger move from the end of the bar and sit on the bar stool next to us. Is it true? I asked him contemptuously. And how much would you ask? Five million, he said without hesitation, taking a long sip from his glass of cognac. With your confidentiality agreement, of course, and I'm willing to sing La Marseillaise while it happens, provided you can pay. I really didn't like this guy and it seemed I wasn't the only one. We all went back to our game, not paying attention to him. So, Donna, my wife said in a cheerful voice, how much does it cost to spend a night with a real hottie? Some rich, famous guy you're secretly drooling over? What's there to think about? I'll do it for free, Donna responded immediately. Wait a second, Dean chimed in. The whole point of this game is to do something you don't want to do for the right price. That's like asking me how much a night with a supermodel costs. There's no point in that. But she breaks her vows. Isn't that worth something? Beth tried to insist. Dean shook his head. I'll tell you what, Beth said with a devilish smile. Let's assume it's with the consent of both of you. How much would you guys ask for to let her spend the night with another man? Dean and Donna looked at each other and then back at Beth. Two million? Dean tried. Don't be stupid, Beth scolded. Let's be realistic. We both know you'll settle for much less. One million? Donna asked hesitantly. This could cause some serious strain on our marriage, so it better be worth it. One hundred thousand, Beth haggled like a slick flea market dealer. Half a million and we'll make a deal, Dean countered. Two hundred thousand was Beth's counteroffer. Four hundred thousand was Donna's next sentence. Come on, guys, Beth said. It's just a one-night stand and he's wearing a condom. You can get a nice down payment on that apartment you've been dreaming about for years, but you'll have to do whatever he asks. Dean and Donna began to whisper to each other and finally unanimously said, 250,000, take it or leave it. I think we have a deal, Beth stated, holding out both hands to her friends. Would you really allow yourself to have your wife for money? I asked Dean with a look of disgust on my face. Fuck off, Jack, you farting cracker. You would too if you got an offer like that. It's easy to say when it's in the air, but once you see the cash, you'll talk differently. Then I guess you don't know me at all, Dean. I'm shocked that you have no self-respect for yourself or your wife. I don't know how you can live with this then. I'd rather commit murder and then commit suicide before agreeing to sell my wife. Heck, with our company capabilities, there's a good chance we'll be millionaires ourselves in the next couple of years if the primaries vote to leave. Whoever comes along will offer us one, two, a lot for our shares. Maybe, maybe not, Dean replied. And here we are talking about a one-time offer to earn in just one night what many couples will not earn in five years of hard work. We live in the 21st century, not the 14th. Your outdated ideals have no place in the modern world. We even talked about the possibility of switching partners someday, so it's not that big of a difference. Then again, that's your talk. A briefcase full of cash on the table, and you'd start singing another song. There is no amount of money to make me agree to such an abomination, I said confidently. Dean obviously didn't believe me. Worse, he clearly didn't respect my position, not to mention that he didn't believe me. I got upset and lost interest in this stupid game. I was just about to get up and go to the toilet when suddenly the tanned stranger opened his mouth again. 50,000. The entire bar turned to look at him. He looked straight at Beth, probably realizing that she was the weak link. 50,000 for an unforgettable night with your wife. How do I know you can actually pay? Beth asked contemptuously. I have the means. He replied smugly, apparently completely sober. Ben can vouch for me here. This wouldn't be the first time I teach a pretentious husband the importance of modesty. I looked at Ben, and he nodded his head grimly. He didn't like that his establishment was involved in such scandals, but there was little he could do. The guy's money was green, and apparently he had a lot of it. If you don't believe me, please Google me, he said. I'm Jacques Blumenthal. All the visitors took out their smartphones and started typing, including me. A wiki article about him with his photo, 
claimed that he was the director and founder of the third largest venture capital fund in the state and that he owned 20% of its shares. The fund specialized in investing in promising startups, and I was surprised to learn that it even owned 22% of our company. Assuming we come to an agreement, Beth said, to my surprise, how are you going to pay? I'll make a direct bank transfer to your account. You'll see the money within one business day, or I can make an instant transfer of cryptocurrency to your digital wallet if you have one. One million dollars, Beth announced. I turned around, shocked, and hit her arm with the back of my hand. What the hell, Beth? Don't you dare touch me, she barked at me. I don't belong to you. This is about our future, and I will make the right decision for both of us, even if you can't. I just stared at her with my mouth open. No offense, honey, you're gorgeous, but not a million-dollar gorgeous, was the man's wise response. One hundred thousand. Seven hundred and fifty, Beth objected. Two hundred and fifty. Just to teach your hubby a lesson he'll never forget, he said without even looking at me. Half a million. Last offer, Beth exclaimed, raising her head and squinting at him. You made a deal, baby, he said, finishing his glass and setting it down on the counter. You will have to do whatever I ask. Your words. Beth began to stand up as I jumped and held her back by grabbing her right arm with both hands. Don't you dare move, I growled through clenched teeth. My angry look was apparently enough to make her sit back down and turn away, frowning. I'll be waiting outside for you in the next five minutes, said this asshole. He placed a few bills on the counter and left the bar. Sorry to interrupt in the midst of tension, but I need to clarify some important things about myself and Beth that are critical to understanding the events that follow. You see, I wasn't your typical college programmer joining a company. Not only did I not go to college, I didn't even graduate from high school. I grew up in a tough area, the kind where you had to fight for your life to survive. If you couldn't fight, you had to scratch, bite, and poke. Anything but give up. By the age of 14, I had already joined a gang, and at 15, I spent six months in juvenile detention for a serious assault. When I was released, my mother did not allow me to leave the house except to go to school. She made me swear that I would not return to that life. I gave her my word and stayed home. I became interested in computers. This interest became an obsession, and at the age of 17, I was already working as a freelancer. Just before I was about to graduate from high school, I received an offer I couldn't refuse and started working full-time as a programmer. My mom didn't like it, but when she saw my first paycheck, she at least acknowledged that I wasn't an idiot for making the choices I had. For the past 11 years, I have worked non-stop, lived frugally, and amassed quite a nest egg, including a digital crypto wallet that has grown significantly over the years. I'm not a millionaire yet, but I don't worry about money either. The salaries paid to good programmers today are ridiculously high, and I have no reason to fear for the future. Beth tried to find out about my financial situation, but I didn't feel the need to share too much information. Neither of us had any plans to start a family anytime soon, so we were fine with just renting an apartment. Apart from Beth and my close family, no one knows about this dark chapter in my life. I have turned my back on this world since I was released from prison, but its lessons have never completely left me. I still had the instinct to retaliate twice for any blow thrown at me, to never leave an insult unanswered, and to never allow anyone to humiliate me. Moreover, I was raised by hardworking migrants who instilled in me the values of modesty, respect, and pride. Sure, I screwed some of them up for a while, but you'd be surprised how much the spirit of the tough, hardworking immigrant and the take-no-shit-and-take-no-prisoners street lifestyle overlap. My grandmother said that if you don't have self-respect, you won't have respect for others, and my grandfather said that it's better to die than to steal, but also never bow to no one. Yes, that's what he said. Other languages use double negatives. Be cultured. Beth and I had been dating for almost a year when the ding-dongs got married. Their wedding had exactly the effect on Beth that was to be expected. I didn't see the point in getting married without planning to start a family right after, but Beth kept pushing me, so eventually I gave in. Did I think Beth was the love of my life at the time? No, but I really loved her. She was beautiful, smart, funny, 
caring and sensitive. Well, most of the time. Would I risk my life to save her? Definitely yes. Would I forgive her for her caustic and deliberate humiliation? Definitely not. I guess I loved her, but I still loved myself more. It's been a minute since that asshole left the bar. You might hear a pin drop or cut the air with a knife. Everyone looked at us as if it were a scene from one of Sergio Leone's westerns. Ding Dong and I exchanged furtive glances. Beth was still looking away. Then came a point where many of you would soon start screaming. What the hell were you thinking? After three drinks, I really wanted to take a leak. So I stood up and said to my loving wife, I'm going to the toilet. I expect to see you here when I get back. If not, don't even think about coming home and you can tell your lover to run away because I'm coming for you both. With these words, I went to the toilet. Now you're probably asking why the hell I would take such a stupid risk when all I had to do was wait a few more minutes. Well, first of all, I really needed to pee. Secondly, I believe in free will. I was glad to inform Beth of the consequences of her possible choice. But as soon as I cooled down a few degrees, I knew I wasn't going to physically stop her from doing anything. Third, and most importantly, I knew my marriage was practically over the minute she started negotiating with him. Humiliating me in public was not something I could accept or forgive. The fact that she accepted his proposal proved to me that she was a woman of easy virtue, perhaps very expensive, but still a woman of easy virtue. I would rather die than let an available woman sleep in my bed, let alone have her raise my children. While in the toilet, I decided that if she was still at the table when I came out, we would end things in a civilized manner. As soon as I came out of the toilet and saw Ben shaking his head, I knew she was gone. I walked over to our table to pick up my wallet, phone, and keys. The ding-dongs looked scared. Dean managed to say with a pleading look, That's a lot of money, Jack. Fuck you, I hissed, letting him know that our friendship was over. I really didn't want to hang out with a couple who were willing to do literally anything when it came to money. Donna didn't even raise her head to look at me. As I headed for the door, I heard a woman behind me shout, I would do the same. A second later, I heard a sharp popping sound. I wasn't sure if it was an angry husband or something else. It's a pity that my apartment was so close. I could really use a long walk to cool down a little more. As soon as I walked into my apartment, I took out my frustration and rage on the large wedding photo hanging on the living room wall. I hit her so hard, so many times, that there was nothing left of her. After that, I moved on to the rest of the photos, then to the furniture, vases, dishes, her clothes, and electronics. I literally tore everything apart. I was so angry that I even destroyed her makeup. I couldn't disassemble the refrigerator, so I started tearing up the food. Hello, Mrs. Miller, I said with a smile. She must have thought it was pure madness. What the hell is wrong with you? It's the middle of the night. Where's Beth? Did you kill her? Please don't shout, Mrs. Miller, I said sarcastically. You'll wake up the neighbors. How many times have I asked you to call me Betty, you imbecile? Okay, Betty, would you like to come in? Much to my surprise, she did just that. My apartment was in complete chaos. Evidence of my rampage was scattered on the floor. It took a while, but Betty finally found a spot on what had been the couch that was strong enough to support her weight. Well, are you going to tell me what the hell made you do that? Or should I just call the county psychiatrist to come and see you? Beth is cheating on me as we speak. Her eyes widened and her mouth fell open in disbelief. She then insisted that I tell her everything. She listened to my story, stopping me here and there to clarify something. When I finished, she thought silently for a while and then said, Many women would do the same. Maybe many, but not the majority, I said confidently. No, of course not most women. So, what are you going to do? First, I'm filing for divorce, I said and I'll buy myself new furniture and electronics, I added with a stupid smile. You should try one of these second-hand apps, she advised me. Look for someone who's going abroad. You can clean out their whole house for pennies. They're desperate to sell. After a short pause, she continued, Do you think Beth will come back despite your threats? I seriously doubt it unless she's suicidal. Do you think you can really hurt her? After she realized I wasn't going to answer, she said, 
Oh, the Fifth Amendment. That's right. Smart choice. Well, I guess she'll have enough money to get by on her own for a while. Are you planning to go behind them, like you said at the bar? I'm usually a man of my word. There's no way in hell I'm going to let her enjoy that dirty money after what she did to me. Look, she said, if he's as rich and influential as you say, that might be a weakness too. Chances are he'll do everything in his power to avoid notoriety. These rats have more money than they do. Can spend their pathetic lives. They care more about their reputation and position of power. If you plan to hurt him, you might want to try something like this. We continued to discuss and explore different options and scenarios. She was probably the smartest person I've ever met. Her analytical thinking and insight, coupled with her amazingly broad life experience, amazed me. It made me think about how sad it is that we have to go through tragic events to recognize some of the people almost literally next to us. At some point, she could no longer stand the discomfort of the broken sofa and invited me to continue our conversation in her apartment over a cup of coffee. I accepted her invitation, and we continued our marathon of planning and scheming until four in the morning. And no, nothing else happened. We were both tired and yawning when I finally retired to my apartment. At least I still had a mattress to sleep on, I will be forever grateful to Mrs. Miller for the time and care she gave me that night. She turned what should have been the worst night of my life into something almost pleasant. I woke up around 10 and the first thing I did was call my manager at work. He wasn't surprised when I told him I needed a few days off to sort out family issues. Apparently, the ding-dongs had already spread rumors about last night's events and no one expected me to show up for work. He also informed me that Beth had called to announce her resignation effective immediately. I assumed that with half a million dollars, she could always find an office job. I thought maybe her new lover had decided to keep her as a toy or pet. After short visits to the bank and my insurance agency, I went to meet with the family law attorney that Betty had recommended. The first phase of the meeting concerned the pending divorce proceedings and was quite boring. I gave him Beth's mother's address and phone number because I had no idea where Beth was. The second stage, however, was much more interesting. I explained to the lawyer that Blumenthal was worth half a billion dollars and that I intended to sue him for $10 million for his active role in destroying my marriage. He immediately tensed up and explained that alienation of affection is only recognized in six federal jurisdictions, but not in ours. He explained to me that the only viable option I had left was to sue him for the long-term psychological damage and for the public humiliation I had suffered. However, he said that it was very doubtful that I would win, especially since we were playing such a provocative game in a public place that was effectively an invitation for anyone to join. I calmly explained to him that I had no plans to actually win or even continue the case for very long. The idea was to use the threat of his exploits being made public as pressure to force him to settle down. He then said that it was outright extortion and that he would not risk his license and reputation for mere gain. This literally made me laugh out loud. I explained to him that I expected a minimum of one million in net profit and that anything over that could be his, provided he could close the deal within the next two weeks. I definitely got his attention. I could see the wheels turning in his head as astronomical numbers flashed before his eyes. Let me call my investigator, he said. He's good. Security footage, other victims like you, maybe even the owner, Ben, you said. Yeah, we can explore some possibilities. Well, okay then, I replied smugly. I also need you to make an appointment with a psychologist as soon as possible, he said. We may need this if we end up in court anyway. Remember, this guy has caused you serious and lasting psychological damage. Let's make sure the expert agrees with that. Otherwise, try to keep as quiet as possible. Our influence only lasts as long as this story remains a secret. If everything becomes public knowledge, he will have nothing to lose. I nodded in understanding. He disappeared for a few minutes and came back with all sorts of forms for me to sign. I left his office feeling very excited and hopeful but I didn't have much time to have fun. I still needed to refurbish my apartment. Friday morning brought a pleasant surprise. 
A beep from my smartphone told me that I had received an important message from my banking app. It turned out that Beth transferred $250 thousand to my account. Very nice of her, I thought to myself. Now I just have to take care of the other half, or at least make sure she doesn't enjoy it. A couple of hours later, I donated the entire amount to an institution for at-risk children. Well done, Beth. There was still a ray of hope in your actions. It was a long, difficult weekend. Although I did everything to avoid it, feelings of loneliness and sadness seeped inside. While I was running for a week, I was in pretty decent shape. But as soon as I stopped making plans and doing anything, memories of Beth surfaced. Our first date, our first kiss, the first time we confessed our love, the first time we made love. This damn woman broke my heart. However, the worst was yet to come. I had to meet with a lawyer and an investigator to review the footage from Babylon. At first, I enjoyed watching us play the game Babylon. There was no doubt that I would miss the Ding Dong's sense of humor. Then came the negotiation stage, and this reopened all the wounds. It was hard to see myself sitting there helpless as my marriage, honor, and pride went down the drain. The lawyer and investigator were right there, watching it with me. This probably wasn't the first time they did this. They had questions, simple questions, but each one stung. I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a few tears. It turned out that Beth ran outside as soon as I got up from the table to go to the toilet. By the way, the girl who called out to me when I was leaving received a resounding slap in the face. By Wednesday morning, I had two cuckolds sign affidavits at my lawyer's office. I didn't ask what the investigator had to do or spend to get them involved in the case. The lawyer persistently hinted that it would be better for me not to ask. Both men were already divorced. I wondered how many more families Mr. Blumenthal had destroyed. On Wednesday afternoon, my lawyer called me to tell me that he had received a tentative offer from Blumenthal's lawyers for $400,000, and he was interested in seeing if I would agree to split it with him in a 1-3 ratio. I said no and hung up. Handset. Two hours later, he called again with a new offer of $600,000 and wanted to know if I would agree to split it with him in a ratio of 1-5. This time I was more open and let him know not to bother me until our original agreement was fulfilled. That evening I went to see Betty. I didn't want to be alone on a Wednesday night. On Thursday, I returned to work. It was strange to see Dean in the office and exchange nods with him. Apart from a few work-related questions, we didn't exchange a word. Even if he wanted to talk about what happened or apologies, he knew there was no point. I will always see him as a spinalist weakling who agreed to pimp his wife and sacrifice his dignity for money. Ironically, it was my wife who agreed to Blumenthal's deal that doomed my friendship with Dean. Without it, I probably would have just laughed at the thought of him having sex with a midget while counting a bunch of money. On Friday morning, my lawyer called, sounding happy. He told me that he was able to reach the agreement we were hoping for, and asked me to come as soon as possible and sign the forms. The agreement included a complex non-disclosure clause that included the threat of a countersue for millions of dollars if I went to the press with any information. The money was transferred the next day. I donated half to a battered women's shelter. By the following Wednesday, the tabloids were flagging a controversial video that showed a respected venture capital fund manager offering half a million dollars for a one-night stand to a married woman as she sat next to her husband at a bar. Just to teach your hubby a lesson he'll never forget, screamed the headlines. Jacques Blumenthal was forced to leave his post two days later. No one could prove that I sent the video to the tabloids, not even Ben. The event took place in a public place. In any case, suspicion was immediately directed towards Ben or one of his employees. Neither my lawyer nor his investigator were in the room when I made copies. In any case, Blumenthal would not have dared to sue the poor husband whose life he had already ruined. However, we shouldn't feel too sorry for him. He was still filthy rich, and sociopaths like him unfortunately recovered very quickly no matter how hard they got hit. However, if he decided to pursue me, I think he would find a borderline sociopath right in front of him. I'm not stupid enough to think he'll challenge me to a one-on-one -on -one fight, but he might send someone. If he ever does, well, 
game of Babel will take on a whole new meaning. I had other plans for Blumenthal after this story leaked, but I decided to leave him alone for a while. After all, he saved me from wasting the rest of my life on someone who was unworthy. As for Beth, no one knows where she is. She hasn't tried to contact me since she left, and vice versa. Her mother told my lawyer that she only contacted her once, a week after that damn Wednesday, telling her that she was fine and that she was taking time off to sort things out. I really hope Beth doesn't show up suddenly. It will be much more interesting to track her down. I'm coming for you, baby. I have big plans for you. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.